you've landed inside Launch Street, the business innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate, differentiate, and get further, faster. Since you're here, we know you're the type of person that recognizes the importance of unlocking your innovation advantage so you can compete and win. And now, your host, the person that has worked with leading companies like Disney, Procter & Gamble, Aero Electronics, the U.S. Army Research Labs, and Red Robin on upping their innovation advantage, Tamara Gontor. What's up, Long Street? Tamara here. Excuse the noise. Um, I'm in a little bit of a loud co-working space today. But hey, I'm here and I have a great interview for you. So I just have to tell you the funniest story first. So I was walking the dog with my 10-year-old this morning and I was telling him how I wanted to get some paint and a canvas to dabble in some art. He said, well, is that because you need a distraction from work? So I said, yeah, kind of. I mean, I'm working on a lot of big things right now and it's kind of stressful. And I thought, you know, painting might help me relieve some of that. He said, why don't you just read a book that isn't a business book for once? I'll let you borrow one of mine. It will take you to a whole new world, Ima. He calls me Ima. I just love that kid. I think, you know, we could all use a little stress relief and distraction. So I'm wondering, peeps, what do you do to relieve your stress or to just create a distraction from work? What hobbies help you take your mind off things? I think the innovative mind needs a rest sometimes. Actually, in fact, when you aren't consciously thinking about something, the subconscious mind can go to work. So it's kind of a double benefit, like consciously distracted and subconsciously innovating. So let me know by sharing a tweet or a post with a handle at Launch Street. I'm totally curious what all of us do to just create that distraction, whether it's, I don't know, a small moment or something that takes a whole day. Let me know. And now speaking of awesome distractions on today's podcast. Lindsay Peterson stopped by Laundry today to talk about branding. Actually, when we dug in, what we were really talking about is clarity, taking a stand, putting values into action, vision, all the things that also impact our ability to innovate and to drive innovation. Branding, clarity and message and purpose is essential, as you'll see from this interview. So Lindsay Peterson is the author of Forging an Ironclad Brand, a Leader's Guide. So it's kind of talking about like why branding isn't just for the marketing people and how all of us on our teams can benefit from having that branding mindset and these tools. So she's a brand strategist and leadership coach who views brand as a blend of science, intuition, behavioral economics, and ancient storytelling. She developed the Ironclad Method while building brands with companies such as Starbucks, Clorox, T-Mobile, and burgeoning startups too. And you'll love her energy. It's just a fascinating conversation. And finally, this podcast is brought to you by Brility Digital. Partway through this interview, I actually break to chat with the founder, Derek Kuhn. Yet another insight bomb. Then I'll take you back to Lindsay and her genius. All right, let's do this. Lindsay, thank you so much for joining me. I know both of us have been pretty excited for this conversation. I'm so glad to be here, Tamara. Yeah, I'm really, I'm so looking forward to digging in. But before we do that, since you're new to our, um, those of us on Launch Street, what's one thing people would be surprised to learn about you? Okay. People would be surprised, even the people who know me well, would probably be surprised to learn that when I was a kid, I was positive that I would go into the Peace Corps. Really? Yes. And, and, <laughs> and what I, made you so positive? Oh, gosh. It felt so, um, it felt both tidy and adventurous at the same time. Like the, the, I could both see the world and have a container for it. I, I think, I mean, I'm kind of psychoanalyzing yeah, myself, yeah, yeah. but I think Adventure, that's why. Adventure, but within structure. Yes, actually. Well put. That's exactly right. <laughs> I kind of like, you know, it's very funny because I, well, I know several people that did it in, from college and it was just kind of one of the, it, well, you're, I think you're younger than I am, but it, I grew up in the eighties and the early nineties. So the Peace Corps was kind of the big thing. Like that's what a lot of us really wanted to do. It was like a really viable al- alternative and I didn't do it, but I always envy the people that did. It sounds so cool. Yeah, I, same thing. It it sounded really cool. It actually sounds really cool now thinking about it, but it really sounded cool in the 80s. You know, maybe this is a stretch, but it kind of makes me think that that's why branding is your thing. <gasps> and Iron Clad Branding is like adventure within structure, right? It's like that this is kind of cr- blend of innovation and communication. <laughs> I think you're right. I 
that is that is quite a connection to make to make but I buy it so you and I were talking before I hit record um, just about how important branding is to innovation how they, you can't have a new idea without being able to communicate it if you really want to know its viability which is kind of why I wanted to have this conversation with you but I want to back up for a second and just make sure we get on the same page with what branding even is because to me like innovation it's one of those words that people use to talk about everything from the font they use on their website to the architecture for their brand and the communication for it. So from your perspective, what is branding? And then obviously I'd love to get into ironclad branding as well. Wonderful. It's so true. This word brand is problematic. It takes people to different places. The way that I define it is your brand. And then I'll talk about branding in a second. Your brand is the thing that you stand for in the mind of your audience. So um, whether your audience is your target customer, whether it is if you're a person, it's the people who you're talking to. If you're a nonprofit organization, it's all of your stakeholders. So what is the the idea in their mind that you own? That's your brand. Branding is all the things that we do to bring that to life. So some of those things are things that happen really, really upstream, including developing the product. Some of those things are things that we happen that happen all the time, our communication, our messaging, the visual imagery that we choose for our logo, um, our copywriting, and everything in between. All of those things that you do, all of the activities that you do as a business that either reinforce or erode that position in the mind of your customer. So before we dig into ironclad branding, I want to ask a question about this because that, that was very helpful in the distinction of like one's what it is and one's how you do it, right? Or how you bring it out there. How much um, control do we have of our brand now versus how much of that is input from our customer? Because I think, right, we, we, like we were talking offline about way, way back in the day when I was in branding, way, way long time ago, it was very hierarchical. Like we told the consumer what to think. And now the, the lines are so blurry. So from your perspective, I, I just love to hear where you think it is today in that way in terms of control around your brand and the branding, really. Yeah, yeah. So the brand, the idea that you stand for is is something that you, it's kind of your internal North Star. So it's the thing that you use to guide your decision making. That hasn't really change like the the uh, the notion that it's a good thing to define where you're going is not is not a new thing what's new is that the mediums are now democratized so it's not the person with the most money has the loudest voice the way that it used to be in the second half of the 20th century um, where TV advertising was the main way that brands communicated and TV advertising is very expensive so only those with a lot of money could, advertise and that's a one that's a it's a it's single it's a single direction it's just from the business to the audience or at least in theory it is and in reality uh, even back then the audience would talk to each other and you would tell your friend and your neighbor what you you know the things that you the brands that you evangelize you you could still do that you just didn't have an internet format to so so your megaphone was really soft so in some ways, like I, 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 I kind of keep these two things separate that uh, there's something very ancient about brand, the idea that in choosing who you are, you can come across, you can be easier to bond with for your audience. That's, that's an old idea. The tools now make it so that your audience has a conversation amongst themselves and back to your company. Um, so I think that the blip is actually not now. It was the second half of the 20th century when TV advertising had its heyday and we had this one-way communication um, between a company and the audience. Because if you go back, you know, a thousand years or several thousand years, people still talked about which is the best butcher in town to buy your meat. Um, it's not as though so, so that's old. And we're not actually more like that now than we were during the second half of the 20th century. So I don't think I think the idea of control is a little bit of a fool's errand. You don't control the way that your audience relates to your business. But that doesn't let you off the hook to put a stake in the ground for what is the thing that you 
want to be in the world um, to set your own direction. So let, let's get hyper-specific and dig into what you are really well known for, which is creating an ironclad brand. In fact, you have this, the book, which I uh, finished last week. It is, I took so many notes. I can't even see where the, the font is from your book because I just wrote all over <laughs> oh, it. Oh, um, what a compliment. So many, books, so many notes. It was so good. But um, the book is Forging an Ironclad Brand, A Leader's Guide. So let's start with, tell me, so we're, now that we're on the same page of kind of what a brand is and branding, um, what is an ironclad brand? Yeah, so an ironclad brand is, if, if you take the notion that brand is the thing that you stand for in the mind of your audience, in the mind of your customer, an ironclad brand is the space that you can own in the mind of your customer that's the most value creating space, that's creating the most value for your customer and therefore the most value for your business. So of the infinite possibilities of the infinite things that you can stand for as a business to your audience. The ironclad brand is the one that creates the most value. So it taps into a need that's really big among consumers um, or among your customer. And it also leverages the thing that you as a business do better than anybody else so that you're the only one who is occupying that space in the customer's mind. Oh, that's interesting. So it's kind of like it's differentiated and it's also defendable. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay. Because there's a lot of, um, you kind of think, um, um, I was I sometimes use this example of pancakes. If you're a pancake brand, and I think this is because I once worked, I once worked with a pancake brand and what they're really excited about is that the pancakes are so delicious. Our pancakes are the yummiest and that's great, but your pancakes, you should be delicious. That's not right. differentiated. That's, that's a category. Of a cost of entry. Yeah. It's a co- that is a cost of entry. If you're a pancake, you have to be delicious. You don't get to pat yourself on the back for that. <laughs> you have to own something that's different. If right. you want to create value for your business, you have to be different. So it's not just about finding something that customers like. They like delicious pancakes. It has to be also something that you own where you are asymmetrical to the rest of the market. So the only organic pancake or the only pancake that uses a Swedish style flour or the only pancake that, um, I don't know, is healthy, right? So what are the, right. what are the ways where you can be both relevant to the customer and different? That's how you create value, not just for your customer, but also for your business. Okay, this is so good. So here's my question, because I need, right? So you have to find the need that you um, fill. And then yes. I think you said better than anyone. So it's really kind of differentiated there. How do you know, let me see if I can, I, I, it's a little jumbled in my head. So bear with me. But how do you know if you're filling the right need and doing it different? Because I find oftentimes um, that we in business, and, and I think this applies whether you're a service or product, Fortune 500 or small, we tend to put features and benefits out there that may be true of the product, but may not be the need um, or, or different as different as we think it is. Like one of my favorites when people say, well, we are right. We taste better. We're more actionable. Like if I call your competitor, they're going to say, you're right. Our taste, we taste like crap. Like you should call them. <laughs> right. Like they're th- like kind of to your pancake example. Yeah. So, and hopefully like I'm asking the question the way that makes sense. I'm, I'm trying to like, I'd love to hear a story around like how you figure that out, because I think that's the hardest part for us is to go, what is the real need or, or problem or whatever it is that we're filling? And mm-hmm. what is it really that makes us different versus what we'd like to think it is? Yeah. The, the first and maybe the hardest answer that comes to mind is not to start with your product or even with your company but to start with what's it like to be this person? What is it like? Get inside their world. Forget about your product for a minute. Even forget about your industry for a minute and think about what is it like? What is a day like for this person? Um, What are the things that worry her? What are the things that bring her joy? What are the things, where are her constraints? Where are her scarcities? Um, and then it start really, really big with from from her standpoint, because in her world, your product or even category probably occupies a very small percentage of what she cares about. So start with what 
what really matters to her and then start moving closer to, okay, now what is the problem? What's it like to be encountering the problem that our product hopefully will solve? What's it like? Uh, we're still not at the product yet. We're at the problem. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and spend most of your time there. I think what is almost kind of like, like, let, let me give an example. If I'm doing interviews of customers or if I'm coaching my clients to do interviews of their customers and you have half an hour on the phone with a, with a customer, spend 25 minutes before you even talk about your brand or your company spend most of the time inside the world of your customer. So that's how you can get away from this kind of reverse engineering your product into your customer's world is starting from the problem and then working to how you're going to solve it um, last. Um, so, So then you're solving a big need because the small needs are the ones that you can communicate with a feature or benefit. Right. Like those are sort of like plugging a hole. But if you're starting with a big human, um, a big human unmet need, um, and and it's something that, by the way, the customer likely is not going to be very articulate about. So you're actually doing a lot of work to synthesize and kind of read between the lines. They're not going to say what I really need is somebody who can um, give me like, uh, you know, some sort of device that is going to read the news to me every day. They're not going to they're not going to get to it's actually not there. If, if they're that articulate about it, it probably isn't that big of an unmet need. Huh. So to really start with um, the, the, the places where they're unartic- inarticulate likely are, but, but where you're still sensing that they're stuck or where there's some emotional charge to it, there's a problem in there and it's hard to solve. Um, and it's kind of our job as innovators to understand the nature of that problem and to design for that problem and not take our neat product and try to tie it back to the customer. If so that's, hard, that's yeah. hard, right? It's hard to yeah. do that. Well, I, I used to, I did spend many years in market research and I, to kind of to what you're saying, I did find over the years that the, the biggest opportunities were, were not in what they could clearly articulate to you, but what I, what they had a lot of passion around, like their frustration. So is that what you're looking for? Is it like, I'm, I'm looking for that, like, oh, moment, even though they can't articulate it, the emotion is there. Yes, exactly. So, if, so here's where you, here's when you know you're not there. When the customer can say, "If my battery life on my smartphone were just fifty percent longer, I would be um, super satisfied." It's like if they can right. if they can make it that if they can get that specific, it probably is not that big of a need or it's or it's or it's at least not something where you're going to be able to sustainably differentiate your solution to that. Right. Well, that's, but say, that's the other point with that, right. Is then somebody else will make it 20% longer and yeah, then 25% it, longer. And then you it's just, an arms race yeah, uh, yeah. where you're, you're, you're just always trying to kind of one upsmanship the competitor. But if you hear your consumer saying, I'm trying to think like, no, since we're talking about smartphones, if you hear the consumer think, um, I work more than I want to. Um, I, I would love to be spending more time with my children. Um, I would love to be more part of their day. Um, I, when I go on business trips, I, I feel so left out for the, from the rest of the family. Oh. Then somebody devises FaceTime, right? right? They didn't say, oh, we've got this teleconference uh, technology. They start with, um, what's it like to be away and want to be present? And the, and they and then they get to it, and that's a way bigger need than battery life or anything that you can resolve with a feature. Who do you think is out there, either in your kind of you came across in researching for your book or in the work that you've done with your clients, who, who's doing it really well and why? <laughs> yeah, the brands that I think are the most um, effective and the most value creating is they're the ones where. Um, there there's the least work that the customer has to do to grasp what that brand is. So mm-hmm. a brand that, that I, I personally love is Volvo. And the reason for that is when I say Volvo, it's almost 
synonymous with safety, the word safety, which is safety, which is a two syllable, um, incredibly specific word around which everything Volvo does is, is to optimize for safety. And because that is so well understood, and by the way, this is true anywhere in the world where I've ever been. When I say Volvo, people say safe or safety or safely or safe drive. It's universal because they're so consistent about everything we do is to optimize for safety. Um, it, it takes the pressure off, uh, the, you don't have to have this really sexy, neato piece of copy. Um, it's nice if you do, it's, it's great if you have good copy, but at the same time, they're, they're using all of their cylinders instead of just one syllable c- cylinder in order to communicate Volvo. It's the, it's the design of the car. It's kind of boxy. Um, it's, it's their patent strategy. They don't take patents on safety features like the three point seatbelt, which they pioneered because huh. it makes their drivers more safe. If everybody has that, right. The, huh. Those, these are things that that's interesting way before you get to messaging, they are, um, landing and, and, and therefore they're creating so much singularity and specificity that their, um, their audience doesn't have to do a lot of cognitive heavy lifting in order to understand, in order to understand them. So it's such a specific place in the head of their customer. So I think that the, that brands that do that are the ones that are the most effective. And, and I think Volvo is kind of best in class and it shows up with everything they do um, from, like I said, the design of the cars to the way that they design their dealerships, the fact that their dealerships have toy rooms in them so that the kids can come and play while their parents are um, test driving cars. You don't see that in a BMW dealership. You don't see that, in, right? It's, it's just a, it's really specific. And that ha- that's well before you get to, you know, um, copywriting and imagery and what a lot of people think of when they first think of branding, it happened way before you got to that. Well, it kind of ladders back to the, what you were saying in the beginning about your brand that you have a North star for it. This is what we stand for. And if that's the case, right. Given your example of Volvo, it, it, and as you were talking, I was like safety, like that that is totally it, but it, it, it has implications across your entire business model and how you do things, not just the advertising, marketing, whatever you put out into the world. Yes, exactly. And that's why that's why I kind of insist that it's the leader who uh, ultimately owns brand because or, or whoever, whoever's making the decisions of how to allocate resources across a business. They're the ones who ultimately own brand because then they can allocate research. OK, our R&D, our, our innovators um, in this business are going to be charged with safety as the metric, not sexiness, not um, ultimate driving machine, not luxury, not, um, you know, any number of other also good ideas, but just safety and can give air cover to those people so that they can focus on that at the expense of other things. So that's the that's what's so wonderful about having a crystal clear brand from an innovation standpoint is then it helps everybody know how to make trade-offs. I'm in a trade-off. We're not going to do a sports car, you know, for Volvo because we stand for safety. Right. Um, Yeah. It wouldn't make sense. And I know that it won't, wouldn't make sense because our leader has said, we're all about safety and we're going to trade off things that don't reinforce safety. Um, I have a few more questions before we do that. I wanted to, I feel like we almost just answered it, but I want to have the conversation with you on the podcast, which is, you know, I think we sometimes think of brand and branding as for marketing people. Um, but we're really having a business conversation. So I would just love to hear from your perspective, kind of why you think as leaders across a business of any kind, we should care about this conversation you and I are having. Yeah. Yeah. So Ultimately, when you have a brand that creates a single minded um, idea in the mind of the customer, which you can only do if you're doing it across everything, the customer experience is not just messaging. When you have that, um, you have a there are a lot of 
economic benefits to it. It elevates your pricing power. You know, preferred brands by definition have the ability to charge higher prices, higher than COGS, higher than their competitors. So it helps you to have healthy margins. Um, it creates a competitive moat. It's difficult to copy brands that are single-mindedly, you know, reinforceably owned in the mind of the customer already. Um, it galvanizes employees who have more of a sense of purpose. It liberates them to focus on a singular idea, which is a gift to your employees. Um, um, all of these things um, happen well before you get to marketing, or, the, or, the, or they can help happen well before you get to marketing. Another way of looking at it is um, some people, some of the listeners may have heard of the four P's framework, uh, which is sort of this classic um, idea that when you're positioning, there are four ways that you can come through in your positioning. So those four P's classically are product, price, place, and promotion. So the product that you develop and all of the things about your product are a way of um, reinforcing your position in the mind of your customer. So is the way that you price it. So is the the, the place, the, the way that you distribute or get your product to your customers. And then promotion, which is the final of the four Ps, what most people think of when they think of marketing and even when they think of brand, that's the communication of all of that. Of those, and by the way, there's no reason to think that there's only four Ps, but the idea is that you can to, to kind of surround surround the ball. Um, product is the most of, of all of those is probably the most important. It's certainly the least forgiving of the of the things that you can do for your customer because no amount of great promotion saves you from a product that doesn't uniquely solve a need. So starting at the very beginning um, is the way that you create this value, create this um, ability to elevate your pricing power that that widens your moat, that galvanizes and sparks and inspires your employees. And it, it you know, the, the majority of it happens before you get to marketing. And, the, and all of it, at least in my mind, all of it is something that the leader can provide air cover to the organization to optimize for that thing. You know, it's so interesting, Lindsay, as we're having this conversation, I, and as I was reading your book, I was thinking about um, some work I need to do at Long Street, first of all, to be a little clearer. I was like, oh, we are not ironclad yet. But also, when I think about the brands that I go and the businesses, and it, it can be like big brands like Southwest or, you know, the coffee shop that I know down the street. But when I think about the ones that I advocate for, um, they are, they're not only super clear, they're very narrow, which is one of the things that you talk about, too, in the book. Um, and what they stand for. So like when I think about, like I always try to fly Southwest, always. Um, I don't always get to, but I try because I'm very clear and I connect with who they are. Because any plane can get me there at the end of the day. Some are better than others in general. But 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 they're, they're, who they are translates across to their hiring practices, how they set up, how you, you know, shuffle into the planes, et cetera. And that's kind of what I hear you saying is it's like you find that point that heart and then it just translates out into everything that you do it's a i love your illustration and the, the the choice of southwest and the way that you just described your own way of relating to southwest you choose so southwest um you know razor razor thin margins in the airline industry um if you have customer loyalty, your margins won't be quite as just a you know a little bit less razor thin. If, if if people are seeking you out, if you're a preferred airline, that's good for your business. And you don't do that just with your um, with your tagline and your copywriting. You do it with every way that the customer experiences. Uh, what you're offering is, and that includes the, you know, the, the way that they answer the phone, um, the, the smile on the face of the person who's boarding you, the boarding process itself. Um, so it's how they recruit people, probably how they exit people. Um, and it creates this economic asset for them as a business that transcends, you know, their, 
tangible goods, which are, you know, um, the leases that they have on their airplanes. And uh, they can have more of a sustainable, enduring business because of their brand. Um, and arguably only because of their brand. Arguably, it's, it's the only reason um, that they are that they exist beyond their tangible assets is because of that. Okay, I am here at Launch Street with Derek Kuhn, who is the president of Brility. Derek, you are the perfect person to have this conversation with. I want to talk to you about business growth because I suspect most of us are doing it wrong. I know I was. So how do you think about growth? Hi. Uh, yeah, hi, Tamara. So you're right. Um, we have definitely seen some challenges how people think about growth. I think it boils down to this. They, um, they have these lofty aspirational goals, and then they have a bunch of disconnected um, plans and to-dos. The, the biggest thing I see, the biggest mistake they make is once they set these objectives and these aspirational goals, they need to spend some time thinking through and uh, defining their strategy. And as we talk about strategy, it's an interlocking concepts that have compounding effect that are based on detailed uh, research about your market opportunity, your company, your competitions, and, and then we form that, which allows us to be adaptive. So, so growth is mostly limited by the lack of a strategy, um, not for lack of goals and certainly not for lack of to-dos, uh, but, but a thoughtful approach to the method behind the growth. So Derek, let me ask you this. When you say compounding effect, I mean, I, I know what that means, but how do you know if you have the right pieces that allow that to happen? Well, that's a that's a great question. And this is where um, our focus on digital platforms really delivers. Uh, in order to judge the effectiveness uh, of your efforts, uh, digital, um, unlike anything in the history of man, finally allows us to see in real time interactions, how things are being affected, the ripple effect as well as the direct effect. And, and then we can adapt continually based on the feedback loop that we get. All right, I'm going to go a little bit personal on Launch Street and on you, but I have to ask because I think I'm not the only one facing this. You know, one of the things I really over here at Launch Street struggle with growth is we've done all these elements to grow. The phone is ringing or, you know, the product is selling, whatever it is. The clients are coming. And then I realized, OMG, I have a delivery problem now. So I hit my, gr my growth. I mean, you'd probably call them goals. But I, I don't know, I don't have a strategy or I haven't figured out how to follow up. So how do you think about those two elements of kind of where you're trying to go and then delivering on that? Yeah, well, let me tell you, first of all, that is a, a common uh, challenge we see amongst our clients uh, and is certainly um, that is what we call a good problem to have uh, most yeah. of the time, right? Yeah. So, uh, and, and it does come back to when we sit down and develop a strategy for our clients, it, scaling is included in growth. Uh, for example, if there are certain aspects of what you offer that, that have capacity, part of a good strategy is going to orient around those first. We prioritize those and then we sequence uh, later growth over the long term. So uh, it is it is definitely something to consider. And if you can build a strategy from the beginning, accounting for both growth and scaling, then you are that is the best way to handle that. That's so fascinating. So what are the initial steps that you have clients take just kind of right out of the gate to better understand where they are versus where they're trying to go and what it's going to take to, to scale, to bridge that gap? That's a great question. So um, I've been doing this for 15 years and developed a process specifically for, for what you just asked. We call it the Digital Presence Assessment, a DPA. And um, what that is, we will sit down with a client um, for about 15 minutes, 30 minutes tops and get a sense of their objectives and their business goals. We then dig into uh, all of the research and we go explore uh, every possible opportunity, the current challenges in the digital space. And we assemble um, a, a, an assessment as to how to proceed um, illustrating, uh, you know, in, in understandable terms, the different options that you have to, to help achieve your goal. And from that space, that assessment, the clients and us uh, form a strategy together. Now, if I'm out there in Launch Street listening and I want a part of this DPA, how do I do that? Well, um, you know, we would be happy to uh, do that. We actually offer it uh, for qualified clients only. We do this for free. Uh, this thing, we used to charge thousands of dollars for it. And, and in some cases, we still do a, a more elaborate one. But this really uh, is self-serving to us because it helps us match up um, 
are the aspirations of the client um, possible to achieve through a through a thorough assessment? And that is that's where so uh, for qualified clients, we do it um, absolutely free. That's awesome. So I will for Launch Street, I will put a link in the show notes to where you can learn more about that. Derek, always a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Oh my gosh, there's so many things swimming in my head. So before I ask you the next question, I want to actually ask you the flip side because I've got some brands swimming in my head that I actually think probably over time have not done a good job of this. Um, and and no means, Lindsay, do you have to throw anyone under the bus? You could use categories, but do you have examples of the opposite? The ones yeah. where they, you know, to your point in the beginning, which I thought was so powerful for Launch Street, for us on Launch Street about like, it's easy for the customer to know who you are. What are the ones that, don't do that. Yeah. Okay. I have two answers. Okay. Um, I've got one, two in my head too. <laughs> okay. And the, and one is like a, w- w- one is if I, it, it's like to think of the counter example, the, if I can think of it, it probably has some value, mm, right? Like okay. the fact that I can, the fact that I can think of it means that it already has, it, it already, I can remember it. If I can recall it, I have some awareness of it. So most brands that are doing poorly, you actually don't know them. And that's actually the whole point. That's right. I I was thinking of it as like a soda brand in particular that I think is wavered on who they are over the years, but I hear what you're saying because I still think about them. Yeah. Well, yeah. Right. Like if you want to kind of go to brass tacks of like, uh, will you still buy them? Um, but I think, okay, so that's one answer. The other is, um, and, and actually maybe it's sort of similar to like the, the category soda brand categories, but I think of, um, AT&T, which is a brand that has very high awareness. Like I bet most listeners have heard of AT&T, but since I don't know what they stand for, I really don't know what they mean. I don't know what, what is the stand that they have taken? What do they care about? Um, what are they good at and not good at? It's not as sharp in my head and therefore I don't trust them. And if I don't trust that I'm not really willing to part with my hard earned money for them unless I have to. And every time I've spent money with AT&T, I've sort of resented the money that I've spent with AT&T. So they're not bringing out size value to me as a customer. So I think of that like a category of brands that are um, that are poor, um, that have poor goodwill um, to their audience, like AT&T or Comcast, or, um, those are bad. Those are just bad brands. The reality is that I still, I do still spend money with them sometimes because I have to, where I don't spend money with those is the ones that I've never heard of. And the reason I've never heard of them is they made it too hard for me to learn about them. That's really, you're kind of, you blew my mind just a little bit there because I really was going through examples of ones that a little bit like Comcast and Pepsi, of course, is who I was thinking of. Um, and cause they're like the opposite of Coke. It's very clear what Coke is about. Pepsi every four years decides there's about something else, but you're right. I think of them and the ones that I don't think about, I probably came across my radar and they made it so hard that I just filtered them out and kept going. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And if you can't, I never thought if, of it that way. You're right. I mean, it's true though. Like, I mean, in, in, in some ways like Pepsi, it's sort of unforgivable with the amount of money that they have, that they still, you know, um, that they still have personality changes every, you know, probably with the change of brand manager hands every right, few totally. years. I mean, that's right. That's just, that's just crazy. Um, and that I completely agree with you on that. Um, I think most of the brands in the world are the ones that are like the mom and pop coffee shop or yoga studio on my street. And they don't have the luxury of being able to spend that much money that, that Pepsi spends when it, it, with everything that they do across right. all four P's. Um, and so for, for them, they actually have a more kind of existential problem of just let's get people to know who we are and how do we do that? Well, let's first choose who we are um, and then use that idea to imbue everything that we do as a business. We, I could think of a lot of examples like Pepsi where money kind of covers up all sorts of sin. They still have high awareness despite <laughs> being well, right. Right. <laughs> um, and, I mean, AT&T too, I think AT&T spends more than a billion dollars a year on TV media alone. So it's, there's a lot of money that goes into creating awareness without creating goodwill among customers. 
But I want to dig in though, because you, we you said it kind of quickly, but I think it, it's really important. You're talking about like the yoga studio on your street who doesn't have the luxury of money to cover up, you know, their their sins. I love how you said that. It's great. <laughs> um, and I think there's a lot of that, um, particularly in the U.S., right? A lot of small, mid-sized businesses. Um, and I think that one of the challenges they face, and I'll just keep going on the yoga example for a second, is you know, yo- there were yoga studios everywhere. I live in Denver. They're everywhere. And then core power yoga came in and decided to stand for something a little fiery in yoga and they crushed the market. Right. And rightfully so, because they did a brilliant job of being very crystal clear about who they were and all these small yoga shops that were probably awesome. I don't know. I couldn't tell you the names of them. I I don't remember them to your other point. Um, But it's because they were so clear. And even at the small and mid size, particularly, I think, at that small and mid-sized level business where you can't afford to not stand for something, your opportunity, your your risk, I guess I should say, is a lot higher. Yes. God, that's a great example. That, and I th- it's interesting because as a yoga practitioner myself, do you say that? Yo- yoga practitioner, yogi, whatever. I a practice yo- yoga. Guy. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yoga. If I have, I I, and we, I'm in Seattle and we have core power yoga in Seattle too. And something does come to mind and I, it yeah. does evoke a feeling in me when I hear core power yoga. And I don't think that I'm their sweet spot target customer, but I know they're like, it did not take me a lot of cognitive effort to organize them in my head. I totally know what they are and what they are not. And, um, that is, that already puts them ahead of most of the rest of the category. Yeah. So it's, it really is true. It's so in some ways, um, I don't love the examples of the mega brands because it's, it's almost like, yeah, but we're not really talking about, we're not talking about a business that has a billion dollars a year to spend on TV media. We're talking about your business. That's that actually just needs all of the economic advantage that it can to break through you know, with a very busy minded customer. Um, and focus is, f- focus is a good ROI, right? Like the more focused you are, right. the, the fewer mistake, the fewer rabbit holes you'll go down. Um, and so core power yoga is a great example of, of, of an unapologetically one, you know, it's, it's one single way to think about yoga and therefore it, you know, it, it helps people to say to it makes it easier for their sweet spot customer to say yes to it. Do you think for us small and mid sized businesses out there, however, I mean that can be anywhere from a hundred thousand a year to, you know, ten, twenty million dollars a year and even more, but do you think it's we struggle with ironclad branding because we're afraid of turning customers away? Like I just yes. thinking about my own personal experience, right? Like I don't want to say no because that's a customer that then won't come to me. And and I intellectually, I get it, right? I get, okay, if I stand for something, I get the right customers. And to your point, there's better ROI. I'm more sustainable. I mean, there's so many business benefits, but I, yet I'm so afraid. Yes. I mean, I think, I think that you absolutely hit the nail on the head that the thing that makes it, even, even though we intellectually know that when we make a choice to focus on something, we're saying no to the things that are, that probably weren't good things anyway, it is really scary to take things off of the table. It really yeah. is. It really is, especially, especially for the leader who's saying, wait a minute. Um, but all of those other things could be customers too. I'm, I'm saying no to them. And I, I, I kind there, so there's there's a couple of ways that I personally as a business owner think about this that helps me resolve it a little bit. One is that um, uh, when you define your your target customer, the person for whom you're going to optimize the rest of your business, you're not. It doesn't mean you're going to say no. It doesn't mean you're going to not accept money from people who are not within that definition of a sweet spot customer, right? Like. Uh, maybe core power yoga is for people who have done yoga a lot already. Um, that doesn't mean they're not going to accept new students as well. Um, it just means that they're going to optimize for their sweet spot. So it's like it's like a bullseye board where you get the most points for hitting the center, but you still get points if you get it on the dartboard. But you're more likely to get on the dartboard at all if you aim for the center. Right. That's like, total, right. Yeah, it totally makes sense. And I think that the people they hire are the right fits right? For that kind of thing, the, the setting and the design of their yoga studios makes sense. 
Um, And the other thing that kind of I hear you saying kind of wrapped up in all that, too, is as a leader, it hopefully means, right, and correct me if I'm wrong, that my team's job is easier because they know what they stand for and they're crystal clear, too. So it's not just about like, um, here's what my brand is, but also now that translates into my my team who does their day to day work, they get the boundaries, too. Yes. And that's so liberating for them to focus on that something that has sharp edges, it, it's so liberating to them and it helps them feel a sense of um, ownership and purpose in it that they they can't have if if you're not choosing a lane as, as the leader. So, um, and therefore they're going to be better at it and therefore they're going to create something that's more um, resonant for the customer. Oh, and you're also going to have happier employees, right? Um So there's kind of this, I mean, in some ways this gets very like philosophical. If you think of like a person that is always changing or like can't, can't quite, um, is kind of wishy-washy. Like one day they're one way, another day they're another way. It depends on which way the wind's blowing. You don't like them as much. You don't trust them as much. You don't bond with them as much. And since brand is kind of a, a, a way to think of it as a relationship between your company and your audience, you're not going to have, have as strong of a relationship as a company if you can't if you don't kind of have enough respect for your customer to 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 put a stake in the ground. They're not going to be as likely to respect you, right? Like it's a it's sort of this two way street. I having said that, I have a huge amount of empathy for this for this fear that it is tricky. Like when you, when you take things off the table, it feels scary. And so in some ways I, what, what I want to encourage people to think about is think of it less as taking money off the table and think of it more as who is the person who is going to get disproportionate goodness from my business? How can we optimize for them? Or who is the person who brings disproportionate value to our business? Let's optimize for them. The rest can fall into this, um, but let's not optimize for the wrong people. You know, it's interesting. I, this is going to sound like a tangent, but it just came to mind. Um, I, you know, as you do a lot of speaking in the work that we do, a lot of keynote speaking, so I'm a member of an association, a speaker association. And one of the things that always blows my mind is I'll meet someone and I'll say, oh, what, are you, you know, what, if you, what is your area of expertise? And they'll say, oh, I'm a, a web designer, a Raiki master, and I talk about um, motivation. And I can't wrap my head around who they are, what they do. And it's, that's on a very personal level, right? Where, you know, I meet people and they say, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm in the innovation space, like done. You know, and I think it's fun. And just on a personal level, like it's so if you think about the language you use to describe yourself, think about how confusing that is when you hear that from someone else, like how that translates into your business. Yes, it's it's all about make it easier, make it easier for your audience to 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 remember you, make it easier for your audience to let you into their head. And the way you make it easier is you make it super clear. You don't say I do both Reiki and <laughs> motivational speaking. Not and to you, pick on either of those, but when you're both, it's like what? <laughs> right. Well, it just it it, it just it, it 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 demanded more cognitive energy from me as the listener. Which, right. if I like them a lot, I might actually expend that cognitive energy. Um, but most of our customers don't really care that much about us until they have a relationship with us. So you're just trying to get them in the door, just make it easier for them to, um, to want to be in a relationship with you to make, make it easier for, for them to grok what you are as a business. I love the idea of measuring cognitive energy, like on a scale of one to 10, like 10 being really good. And one being more, or maybe the other way around, I guess it would probably make more sense, but of like actually going into your business and be like, how much cognitive energy does it take my customers to do business with me? That is so awesome tomorrow. I'm going to use that. I, I love that. It's like, let's grade ourselves on, um, yeah. yeah, the level of like neurological, like glucose that was expended <laughs> because we have the, the, like, let's just be really honest here. How easy did we make it for people to let us into their head? Um, yeah. and that's actually the empathetic way to be as a business. Well, and it really speaks to me because I think um, one of the things that we all have to be mindful of, and I think we all are, at least I am, I'm exhausted. Like the number of inputs that I get every day and people and businesses and brands trying to get my attention is exhausting. The energy that I have to put out even to just 
remove that stuff from my brain is tremendous <sighs> these days. So the idea of measuring that for our own businesses, I think would, I don't know, for me, it personally resonates because I feel exhausted by the inputs that I get every day. I love that. It kind of brings us full circle to the, to your first question about kind of brand and like the, how brand has or has not evolved in a way, what you could argue is in an, in an environment where we, where we're competing with more stimuli, where our customer has more coming at them. Um, it's actually behooves us even more to be focused. It's actually, it's actually like, instead of them choosing between a hundred things to focus on, they're choosing between a hundred thousand things to focus on in this given second. So it's even more important that you're singular and making it super, super easy for them to let in. Not less, it's not less important. It's more important. Right. Yeah. And that is personally really how I feel that I have a hundred thousand choices to make every single day. So please, for love of God, don't make it hard, which is why I think your book, The Iron Cloud is so good. So I, I do want to spend a couple minutes talking about a few of them, because as I was reading through the nine criteria that you have for Iron Cloud branding, a couple of them surprised me. Um, so I'd love to just go through those and kind of get your thoughts on why they're so important, how they made the top nine. Um, and I'll say all three of them just to, cause I'm not sure how they kind of, from your perspective fit together. So one is that it's asymmetrical. Um, two is that it has teeth and three that it's narrow. And I feel like the narrow we've actually kind of covered about the focus. But, right. Yeah. But the, but the other two really, when I started to read that, I was like, huh, I would have never thought of it that way. Yeah. Yeah. So asymmetrical is this idea that you have to lean into where you are not only strong, but where you have an asymmetric strength, either because of some IP that you hold or culture or your history or your people or your technology, that there's something that makes you, some people call it your unfair advantage. The thing that where you just like people just don't have a chance against you because of this thing that is so disproportionately um, meaningful. So I think of of an asymmetrical brand as Gore-Tex. So Gore-Tex has this asymmetrical advantage in waterproof fabrics because it kind of invented and patented and certainly pioneered the technology for their first fabric in 1969. So they have this gold standard in waterproof fibers. They are asymmetrically in this place of advantage um, when it comes to the idea of waterproof. So they, they, they can really own that in their market. And then the other one you mentioned is um, one of the, criteria for ironclad brands are that they have teeth. I, I call it having teeth. And that is that it needs to be backed up by fact. It needs to be a promise that's not only true, but it's demonstrably true. So it's easy for somebody to believe it. So when somebody makes it, when a brand makes a promise that's really big and and aspirational, but it's not anchored in something that's, um, that's clear and evident, it doesn't, it, 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 that's, that's a brand that would not have teeth. And if it doesn't have teeth, then the customer's not going to believe it and they're not going to trust it. They're not going to let it in. Um, so a brand that does a great job of having teeth is Geico. So Geico, mm -hmm. their claim is 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. 15 minutes is fast, but it's not so fast that it's not believable. 15% um, is substantial, but it doesn't sound like an overpromise. Um, you know, the matching of 15 minutes with 15% makes the promise memorably specific. So that's a brand that has teeth and therefore like it's got this nice sharpness in my mind. When I think of Geico, it's really easy for me to grasp what they represent. And I correct me if I'm wrong with them because I don't use Geico, but I, I have to imagine they also actually can back that up, right? Like yes. they're not, they're not saying that. And then every experience with them is the opposite. Yes. If you make a promise and you don't deliver on the premise, um, at best, you might have some people, you know, some first time buyers, um, but you're going to have high churn or you're going to have low repeat. If you know, if you're in consumer packaged goods, we call that a low, a low repeat business where people try it, but they don't keep buying it. Or in insurance, they would call that a high churn business where people try it because they've heard this great promise, but they churn right out because you've broken the promise that you made. So yeah, you, you, you have to deliver that. In fact, that's one of, one of the criterion 
for ironclad brands is that it, you have to deliver on it consistently with the big things and with the little things, um, with the, you know, the letter of the promise, but also the spirit of the promise, you always have to deliver it. Otherwise, um, you're not going to create outsized value for your business because you're not going to have high loyalty. You're just going to have a lot of first time buyers. So part of the reason why I picked on those three, um, after reading the book is cause I think they were all really good, but is because those are the three that I felt like kind of goes back to actually what we we're talking about in the beginning. Um, that we often get, uh, I don't know if lazy is the right word, but we, we are, we don't do our due diligence. So like with the asymmetrical kind of what we are saying, we go, well, we taste the best. Right. Like we we assume something because we want to believe it versus really digging in to say what really is our advantage. And in that I love I love the word asymmetrical because it really I can visualize how it's unique and not just the same as everybody else. But I think we get again, I'm not sure lazy is the right word, but we don't really find it. And maybe it's because we don't want to realize we don't have one and we have to figure out what it is. Um, I think that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, it could be right. Like we don't want to own like, oh, my God, we're just like everybody else. Um, and then the teeth, the same thing. I think we have a tendency to over promise and be overly aspirational with how we position things to, to our detriment. Um, and you see that I was like, everything is transformative these days. I'm like, really you oh, transform God. my life with that. I don't know, whatever it is, <laughs> drink like, okay. Right. Right. How about you just make <laughs> me feel a little better? <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. I got it. I, I bought a, a mouse for my computer and the, it, it was it was a brand I had never heard of. I got it on Amazon and the box that it came in, something said like um, unlock value for your life or something right. crazy, like uh, just a very big promise for a mouse, for a computer mouse. And I just kind of laughed at it. I mean, are you kidding me? Really? Um, and so they don't they, they just kind of lack credibility for yeah. me and therefore I'm not going to be loyal to it. Right. And it's, and I think the over, I think there's kind of two areas that one is the over promise in the beginning of like, this is going to rock your world. This new, I don't know. I just bought a pillow for my tub, like a head pillow. And it was like, you know, um, rejuvenate and revive and find yourself on the packaging. And I just died laughing. Cause I was like, really, <laughs> I just don't want to hit my head on the porcelain. That's all. That's all I'm asking. You know, <laughs> I thought it was so funny. It was the only option. Otherwise I wouldn't have bought it. Cause it made me roll my eyes. Um, so that's part one. And then part two, I think is not delivering to your point. And then that lacks repeat and, and you lose customers fast. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you have to, you have to make a really meaningful promise, but you have to know that you're going to be, de- be able to deliver on it um, time and time again, whether it's their first time with it or the thousandth time with it, that you're delivering on that promise. Um, otherwise they're going to switch or, I mean, th- they also are going to be less likely to tell their friends about you if they don't right. like it or they will, but it'll be a bad, in a bad way. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. I could, I could keep going just about the nine criteria, but I do have to close this out. I can't even believe it. I could keep, we might have to do a round two cause I have more questions. Um, I want to bring it back to innovation for a second. How does ironclad branding help me as a leader ignite innovation in my team? The first thing that comes to mind for me is that you're pushing decision making when you when you define the single idea, the singular idea, you're pushing decision making to them. You're allowing them to um, to own the idea. So it it enables them to be focused on something that will um, require some, if you're not going to hedge on your promise, it will require some making trade-offs. Um, but like if, if we think about Volvo, Volvo engineers, they love working for Volvo because there isn't a flavor of the day innovation mandate. They're always, always doing things to reinforce the delivery of safety from the way that the car is built to the way that the dealerships are structured. So that galvanizes them to create more value in a way that only your brand can create value. So that's the, like the, the big, the big way to think about, about it. But I also think about it kind of selfishly, if I'm the leader, I want my team to be focused on something that's going to create the most value with, you know, their time and resources. So the the whole idea of defining the right brand idea is it's going to be the brand idea that will create that, will enable them to be spending their limited time and budgets on the things that will build the most value 
unique value for this business. So it's really like, it's, it's really a North star for where you want all, all innovation to fall under, um, um, is to optimize for this idea that you're defining with your brand. I mean, I could not agree more. I think those boundaries actually foster innovation because you're not just throwing stuff on the wall to see what sticks. You're clear about where you're headed. Um, and what, what platform you are or foundation you're using for innovation. I think all too often we go, Oh, we're going to innovate. So let's throw away all this and go create something crazy new without, without bringing it back into what you said, it creates a clarity that we don't often have. And it's hard to innovate when there's no clarity. It's actually really hard. Um, harder than we, think. We, we think it's yeah. all chaos, but it's actually not. There's a kind of a, there needs to be it's kind of go all the way back to Peace Corps. It's structure and adventure. Who knew? Yes. It all goes back Who to Peace knew? Corps. Um, <laughs> all right, before we close out, where can people go to learn more and connect with you? Yeah. So my book is Forging an Ironclad Brand. It's available on Amazon, et cetera. And if listeners are interested, I have a free giveaway on ironcladbrandstrategy.com. That's my web, my business's website. And it's a workbook that I adapted from the book, Forging an Ironclad Brand, that serves as a supplement to the book. So it's kind of this step-by-step workbook guide of the method that I use when I'm building a brand strategy with my clients. So you can find that at ironcladbrandstrategy.com. Awesome. We will put the links to that in the show notes. Um, My last question for you is kind of what's your one piece of advice for us launch readers to kind of just that first step that we can take to build an ironclad brand? Yeah. Get crystal clear about your target customer and talk to them and continually talk to them. Learn about their lives, learn about the problem in their lives that you're trying to solve and really feel it and be in it with them. And that empathy will enable you to solve big problems for them and take the most robust route to doing so. I love it. And it goes back to what we were saying um, earlier, which is kind of what you're saying about really start with them and work backwards versus start starting with you, your brand and working forward. So thank you. Cause I think that is a critical piece of advice that we somehow lose along the way in an effort to just do the things that we do in the weeds every single day. So exactly. Lindsay, thank you so much for coming by. I think we might have to bring you back. Cause like I said, I've got about 15 more questions that came up because of this conversation that I didn't I get know. to ask. So. I know. I would love it. I would love to do it again. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you tomorrow. So good, right? Oh my gosh. Wasn't her energy fantastic? More importantly, her knowledge. So you probably noticed by Lindsay's language that she's an inquisitive collaborative. That's her innovator archetype. If how Lindsay spoke and thought felt familiar or even just resonated with you, you might be an inquisitive collaborative too. I think you should go ahead and go to our website and find out your innovator archetype, which is your natural superpowers and competitive advantage. All right. Tamara, out. Thanks for hanging with us on Inside Launch Street. If you know someone that is truly ready to unlock their innovation advantage, have them join you on Launch Street. Discover your innovation advantage. Build a team of high-performing innovators and ignite ideas and solutions that create massive impact. G-O-T-O, LaunchStreet.com. Remember, innovators, if you don't take the leap, somebody else will.